where we live. Mm. So, yeah, that's me banging on again. All right, come on. Let's... Uh, star rating, Paul. For, oh. for Baby Driver. Baby Driver. Enjoyed it. Eight. I'm going to say eight, two. Excellent. And that's <laughs> Baby Driver. <laughs> um, okay. So eight stars from Paul and eight stars from me for Baby Driver. Yep. Yep. Well, well, we're well on the thirty-minute mark now, so we, we'll. we'll um, so that's Baby Driver. We do you think people should watch it? I think it is awesome, and I think people should watch it. I think people should watch it too, mm. even with Kevin Spacey in it. Yes. So maybe watch the film and then look up. But don't you think we should have had Kevin that, Spacey? We should have at least had that conversation. I think it's a conversation worth having. Um, no, I do. I do, yeah. especially with what's happening in Australian government as well, and other things that are happening around the world. And but. Um, it just means that I need to be a bit more organised and considered and um, I should have actually looked up what, how Kevin Spacey was going but I, I didn't because I'm unorganised. Well, I'll tell you what, I'll give you some homework. Would you like some homework? <laughs> Not really, Because you no. do stuff all anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do nothing. I just sit at home all day and do nothing. No, I don't. Um, anyway, so um, Paul's magic movie moment. Yes, yes, because once again we – came to today and we're sitting and chatting going, well, I haven't even got a magic movie moment yet. See, this is this is why people pay the big bucks to come and listen to us. Um, so, yes, yeah, so here so, it is. Uh, so on. should I discuss what yeah, it is? You should tell people what it is before they listen to it. Yeah, well, that would be professional, wouldn't it? Mm-hmm. Uh, okay, well, this is a bit of a classic. This is a movie moment and I think it's a classic and I think most people would come around to it. It is the the very famous scene with Jack Nicholson and um, Tom Cruise. Tom Cruise. Thank you. You, you saw, saw the you blank saw look. The... <laughs> I saw the blank look. <laughs> <laughs> and um, they're in the courthouse together, and it's a few good men. So this is a good one. Here we go, guys. Thanks, Danny. I love Washington. Excuse me. I didn't dismiss you. I beg your pardon. I'm not through with my examination. Sit down. Colonel. What's that? I'd appreciate if he would dress me as Colonel or Sir. I believe I've earned it. Defense counsel will address the witness as Colonel or Sir. I don't know what the hell kind of unit you're running here. And the witness will address this court as Judge or Your Honor. I'm quite certain I've earned it. Take your seat, Colonel. What do you want to discuss now? My favorite color? Colonel, the 6 a.m. flight was the first one off the base? Yes. There wasn't a flight that left seven hours earlier and landed at Andrews Air Force Base at 2 a.m. Lieutenant, I think we've covered this, haven't we? Your Honor, these are the Tower Chief's logs for both Guantanamo Bay and Andrews Air Force Base. Guantanamo log lists no flight that left at 11 p.m. and the Andrews log lists no flight that landed at 2 a.m. I'd like to admit them as defense exhibits Alpha and Bravo. I don't understand. You're admitting evidence of a flight that never existed. Oh, we believe it did, sir. Defense will be calling Airman Cecil O'Malley and Airman Anthony Rodriguez. They were working the ground crew at Andrews at 2 a.m. on the 7th. Your Honor, these men weren't on the list. Rebuttal witnesses, Your Honor, are called specifically to refute testimony offered under direct examination. I'll allow the witnesses. This is ridiculous. Colonel, a moment ago, check the tower logs for Christ's sake. Well, we'll get to the airman in just a minute, sir. A moment ago, you said that you ordered Lieutenant Kendrick to tell his men that Santiago wasn't to be touched. That's right. And Lieutenant Kendrick was clear on what you wanted? Crystal. Any chance Lieutenant Kendrick ignored the order? Ignored the order? Any chance he forgot about it? No. Any chance Lieutenant Kendrick left your office and said, the old man is wrong? No. When Lieutenant Kendrick spoke to the platoon and ordered them not to touch Santiago, any chance they ignored him? You ever served in an infantry unit, son? No, sir. Ever served in a forward area? No, sir. Ever put your life in another man's hands? Asked him to put his life in yours? No, sir. We follow orders, son. We follow orders or people die. It's that simple. Are we clear? Yes, sir. Are we clear? Crystal. 
Colonel, I have just one more question before I call Airman O'Malley and Airman Rodriguez. If you gave an order that Santiago wasn't to be touched, and your orders are always followed, then why would Santiago be in danger? Why would it be necessary to transfer him off the base? Santiago was a substandard Marine. He was being transferred... That's not what you said. You said he was being transferred because he was in grave danger. That's correct. You said I... he was in danger. I said grave danger. You said, is there I any... I recall other... what I said. I can have the court reporter read back to you. I know you. what I said. I don't have to have it read back to me like I'm... Why the two order. orders? Colonel? Sometimes men take matters into their own hands. No, sir, you made it clear just a moment ago that your men never take matters in their own hands. Your men follow orders or people die. So Santiago shouldn't have been in any danger at all, should he have, Colonel? You snotty little bastard. Your Honor, I'd like to ask for a recess. I'd like an answer to the question, Judge. The court will wait for an answer. If Lieutenant Kendrick gave an order that Santiago wasn't to be touched, then why did he have to be transferred? Colonel? Lieutenant Kendrick ordered the code red, didn't he? Because that's what you told Lieutenant Kendrick to do. Object! And when it went bad, you cut country. these guys loose! Your Honor, you had Marcus inside a bony trance. Your Honor, you doctored the logbook. Damn it, Captain! You told us to doctor Consider yourself in contempt. You. Colonel Jessup, did you order the code red? You don't have to answer that question. I'll answer the question. You want answers? I think I'm entitled. You want answers! I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! And no, I won't. <laughs> I won't. You were going to. I could see it. I wanted to, but I won't. Thank you. You're quite welcome. <laughs> Who says I don't have restraint? <laughs> it's hard. Because you go... <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, that was love. That was great. Great fun. Okay. So our second film was put up by Malcolm. Yay. Hi, Mel. <laughs> <laughs> and I did watch out for him. <laughs> yep. Evil henchman number two. Evil henchman number two. He was the one who pushed past the lady. He ran forward and, yeah. and he was pushing past her. In a suit. I, I believe he put an elbow into her face. I didn't see the elbow no, in No, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just amping it up. But before we talk about this film, mm. I would just like to say the following. We acknowledge the traditional owners of the country on which we meet today, the Wurudjuri, and recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and culture. We pay our respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. So we are watching the movie The Sapphires. Right, which is an Aboriginal movie. Yes. Okay, now, can we have a little quick conversation as to why we did that? Because some people who haven't thought all the way through it might be rolling their eyes at that, but I think it's worth um, just delving into that. Uh, Look, we had this conversation before, and, and I asked the question earlier on the week, do... Should we say something uh, in... in so this was my idea. Uh, and we had a, a quick discussion about whether... It, well, some people would call it political correctness, but you know, I'd like to think of it more as consideration and respect. Um, well, we're discussing a film that's created by Aboriginal people about an event that happened in our past mm. to Aboriginal people. Yep. So when discussing that, we probably need... We, to, to acknowledge. We need to acknowledge yep. um, that, that we're talking about it. and um, Yep. yep. Because, yeah, you, you, you don't know who's listening and and so so consequently you should be respectful of those people who... Well, they have a tie for the... Um, or they all, all their um, clans, tribes, people, they all have a connection. So if you're discussing uh, members of their family or tribe... Mm. Um, You've got to acknowledge that's, that's that, right. That, 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 that's what we're doing today. Okay, right. So, the synopsis, please. Oh, I'm reading again. Goodness. Yeah, oh, you, you, what a you, roll. You'll uh, have learned how to read by the time you finished. In 1968, four Australian Aboriginal women entertained the US troops during the war in Vietnam. Mm. Along the way, they learned about love, belonging, and the hardships of war. And that was really short because... Well, yeah. that's, that's, that's all she wrote. 
it's quite literally. Well, it's basically looking at all those aspects, this film. Mm. Yep. So, yes. Did you enjoy the film, Paul? <sighs> okay. Uh, I thought it was quite an emotional movie. Uh, now, it's an Australian movie, so consequently it's not going to be done with a big budget. No. Um, there are not a lot of movies that address Aboriginal issues in Australia. Uh, I think Australian movie makers have a tendency of shying away from them. I think, we've only, I think we've only just started in the last few years doing this. I just don't think that people, uh, that people uh, in the trade think that they're going to necessarily sell do you know what I mean? Like, um, it is I, a, it is a black part of our history. Well, and I have to admit, Australians tend to get a bit funny about it because we're like, oh, that was really bad, and we're really sorry, and we don't know how to deal with this, and mm. we tend to do that a lot. We're very non-confrontational, even a, though a, a, apologetic, and yet strange at the same time. We can be as a nation non-apologetic for many, many, many decades. Mm. So yes. yes, it's it's a conundrum wrapped in an enigma. Um, <laughs> Look, but I mean, m- Sapphires m- is a 2012 film. It is, and so they've only they've, these sorts of films like the Ten Canoes and Rabbit Proof Fence. They're all just this. They're fairly new. Yes, so they're only coming out. Now. And there should be more of them, as far as I'm concerned, mm. um, because they're Australian stories. They they're are just and- as much, and they're just as relevant as things like Gallipoli and Mad Max and all the rest of them. All are good. Well, it's also educational. People might not know about these things mm. unless they get told. Yep. Yep. So. Okay, so the synopsis uh, leads. Well, the synopsis was short. <laughs> was very short, and it kind of glossed over a lot of. No, because I assumed you would want to have a chat about it, so right. I thought I'd leave it up to okay. you. Okay, so let's let's talk at some of the main issues that were in the film, then, shall we? Um, Which one do you want to start with? Well, let's talk about uh, the stolen generation, because I think even though it wasn't front and centre. It certainly was prominent mm. uh, in that one of the girls was stolen, and that's, that's yes, and that's because she was one of the uh, the lighter skinned Aboriginal girls. They, they were stealing lots of children, but they were concentrating on the fair kids. Yes, yes. I mean, children even up to the seventies, children were still being removed from their families, mm. and that connection gone, and just expected to be brought up now. I'm, in in a totally different setting. Now I'm going to add a little bit of extra to this. Uh, that in itself would be hugely traumatic. Um, now I myself am, are adopted, but I was adopted from the birth sort of thing, and you know I, I went from an orphanage into um, how would you describe them? A non-functioning family or <laughs> a poorly functioning family. And so consequently went out from there sort of thing. So there is a a vast chasm in your own soul sort of thing caused by that sort of thing. But I could not imagine myself. And and so uh, people would say, well, how do you you deal with it? You do deal. You just, it's just a part of who you are. It's not, you know, and it can directly affect you. But to have had some of your culture... I like mean, when she you're was growing 10. up and she then was 10 ripped away was, from that, yes. Um, when she was taken, I'm thinking, well, mm. hang on, you're already an established, you're aware of yourself, you know who you yep. are. and Yep. No, it would just tear, tear a person to, to pieces. And you see, once you get torn from that, it's so hard to make your way back there. And I think this was a very optimistic film in that respect, in that that girl was able to go back in the end and re-establish herself within that community. Mm. And... Look, one thing, a lot of, um, there's a lot of misapprehensions about Aboriginals amongst white people here in Australia, and I think most of it's unfounded. Um, From my own experience, and it's not been huge, and I'm sure other people may have had other experiences which would counter my experiences, but like, um, I, I... found that their sense of family is far more pronounced than what a, uh, a normal white community sense of family in Australia is. You know, the, it's this vast, sprawling um, communal family, that concept that they've got going. It must be, it must be such a, oh, 
What's the word? It must be such a solace for them in, in that at least they've got something like that to, to, to come back to. Assuming that everybody's operating in, and, and not spinning out of control inside that society. Well, that's the hard-